Y'all see that we in these little spaceship looking chairs. <laughs> um, we here at, um, in, uh, where are we, College Park? Yeah. Uh, University of Maryland College Park. So a lot of y'all have probably seen them on TV. The Terps, um, and especially sports-wise. I remember hearing about the Terps from when I was younger. And um, I just finished doing a dope panel discussion with um, another, some other educators and uh, advisors from here, from the uh, University of Maryland. And we were pouring into the lives of some of the students who are trying to mat matriculate into the University of Maryland. Um, and so um, they had a panel discussion just kind of like letting them know about some things that, things that they can expect. Randall, uh, as y'all know, works here at the University of Maryland. He's one of the uh, folks that set this thing up, man. So can you let them know a little bit about what we were doing here today? Sure, absolutely. Um, props to uh, Vaughn and, and Paul for coming through. Um, it was a great experience. Essentially what, what we were doing was trying to, um, as Vaughn mentioned, prepare students for transitioning into the University of Maryland. Um, there are a lot of things that, uh, and obstacles that may come their way, especially mm -hmm. <laughs> as mm -hmm. potentially student athletes and leaders of, of different, uh, in different ways on campus. So we wanted to make sure that they were equipped, um, kind of confident, and they had a realistic view of what college will be and, and what it could be for their future. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, so it was tight. Um, any, any, they were about, hold on, I'm gonna read off some of the questions that they asked that we were discussing. And I, we recorded it so that you all will get to see um, at least some of my views. I can't put everything on it because I don't know some of the other people who want some of their views shared, but um, you at least get to hear some of my views on the questions that were asked. But um, this, some of the questions that were asked were, describe any challenges you face in your transition from high school to college. These challenges, um, well, I don't gotta read that part. Describe the decision-making process for you as you settled on a major to study who or what resource on your campus was instrumental in your maturity. If you could change anything about your college experience, what would it be? Describe the adjustments made, if any uh, challenges faced in your transition from undergrad to working the working world or to graduate professional school, and uh, tell students what you think the purpose of college is, slash any advice you want lasting with the students. Um, so I don't know, did any of those questions stand out to you all in particular or any of the responses that were given stand out to you all in particular that you think can help our um, young black America uh, population? I would say for me, one of the benefits that I had going to Andrews is number one, I, I got to go away for school. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, for me, I think that was really an important factor and you guys kind of touched on that a little bit you know growing up you're in the same community you're around the same friends you know from kindergarten up to 12th grade same environment same mentality and so to be able to kind of go away for four years or however long you spent in uh, undergrad um, and just to create new experiences you know to meet new people you know I went to Andrews and so it was incredibly diverse so people from all around the world were at Andrews. So just being able to meet people from different cultures, different backgrounds, um, that was one of the things for me that was really critical. And then number two, um, the transition from being in a very structured environment in high school. You know, you have your teachers, you're in the same class, um, you know, you have your parents, and then going to college where Pretty much you're on your own like mm -hmm. everything is up to you your decision your classes are scattered throughout the day you have a bunch of quote-unquote free time that you don't realize until later that you should be actually studying mm -hmm. instead of just hanging out mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and so those kind of decisions that you have to start to make as you're transitioning to college um you know transitioning into adulthood essentially um, that was really one of the big transitions mm -hmm. you know, for me mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i'll, I'll say for me uh, kind of building off what Paul said. I mean, coming into college, people 
puts you in the box, right? Uh, based on how you look, where you're from, the way you speak. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, we all socialize and believe certain things about people who are different from mm-hmm. us, right? Mm-hmm. We have a lot of students in there who went to all black school, um, some went to all white school, mm-hmm. some that went to pretty diverse schools, right? So uh, I, I think we're very much a product of what we grow up around and, and what, uh, you know, whether it's school, church, the home, uh, that's the, the most impactful teacher for us. That's how we kind of base our perceptions of others. So mm-hmm. being able to, you know, kind of step outside of that box, you know, understand the significance of being able to, you know, present yourself in, in a way that's beyond a stereotype or beyond a single story, I think is really, really important. You do that by challenging, thinking critically about your world. Absolutely. Right? Um, okay. Getting new perspectives. You know, not just doing what's comfortable and convenient, but you know, again, pushing beyond that. So I think I think these students are, are um, going to be better prepared actually than mm-hmm. uh, your typical freshman because they're having these mm-hmm. conversations, mm-hmm. right? And um, I think they'll be much better for it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, yeah, it was. A, it, I love the diverse crowd that was there, or what have you. The diverse perspectives. Um, and as much as you can, you know, I think, and you just touched on this, Randall, but have these types of conversations. Uh, the reason why we're doing these videos for y'all is because we know that we have these types of conversations all the time. And maybe some of you may not be in a position to where you can have them with somebody else, but at least through hearing us um, discuss, you, you can get some perspectives on some of these things that you're going to go through uh, in your life or some of y'all have already been through some of these things and it's just hear, good hearing that other people have gone through some of them also man and so um, real quick I want to transition into this topic like Paul was Paul was discussing this earlier and he was kind of passionate about it uh, <laughs> Randall wasn't here at the time so he doesn't know but uh, w- uh, what was it so and shout out to the whole, um, so there's this group that, um, that, um, that I've been engaging with on Facebook called SDAs for Social Justice. And, um, and I just want to shout them out because they're, they're, they're trying to come together and uh, put in work to address some of the issues that we've been dealing with, especially as, as it pertains to Black Lives Matter or what have you. So shout out to them. This was actually happened to be, uh, Paul didn't even notice, but this happened to be one of the topics that I saw being discussed in there. Um, and I saw, matter of fact, shout out to Jaina, um, who hopefully we'll have on the show one of these days also. But um, she was talking about the fact that Michael Jordan finally spoke out about all the issues going on with Black Lives Matter. And um, it was shocking to me because if there's any person who I've always thought of in my mind, like waiting for celebrities to, to uh, who, celebrities who have been making money because of black culture, and, um, and, but I haven't heard them say anything about what black young people are actually going through, the people who buy their product the most. One of those people was Michael Jordan, who is from the black community of all places. Born in Brooklyn, as a matter of fact, where I was born. I think all of us were born, even though all we, well, you were born in Manhattan, right? But, but we're all Long Island boys, but we started off in the city, right? So, and Michael Jordan is one of the people that we've looked up to, and I've always wanted to hear, like, yo, what are his views on this? I wanted him to speak up. So Paul um, was very passionate about something that was going on with this thing. So I want Paul, Paul, you start us off, and then me and Randall will, will jump in there when we find points to jump in there, man. Nah, the one thing I was just saying is that, like, okay, he put out his thing on, on Monday or whatever, mm-hmm. and then people, instead of just, okay, accepting the fact that finally he spoke up, he said something, you know, he, he made his contribution, you know, a lot of people are complaining about the way he did it or the fact that he waited so long, those kind of things. Like, for me, I don't know. I... Like you said, we all grew up loving Michael Jordan, you know, wanting to be like Mike. And, um, but even just now, like he's one of the guys who's really transitioned effectively out of his playing career, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? A lot of NBA guys, they make a lot of money, but then after they're afterwards, you know, you don't really hear from them. They, some of them lose their money, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. But this guy is the only majority black owner of a NBA franchise, I think even in any of the four major sports, if I'm not mistaken, probably NFL, NHL, I mean, MLB. I know wasn't Magic Johnson like 
owning the LA Dodge or something like that for one True, season. true. But I don't I know if he was a majority or an owner though. But right. I know that he was. Yeah, he's a part owner. But Michael is a majority owner, and you know, if you look at his organization, he employs the highest percentage of minorities. Um, you know, in any of the the pro teams, I didn't even know that organization. I didn't know that. And so, just the, the fact that. Just because he didn't speak out necessarily mm -hmm. doesn't mean that he's not, mm -hmm. he doesn't care or he hasn't been doing his thing or he hasn't been playing his part. You know, if you look at the Jordan brand, you know, a high percentage of the people that work in the Jordan brand, which is a $2 billion company, you know, are African American or are minorities. And so, you know, even though he hasn't necessarily made public statements, you know, he's been doing his thing. Mm -hmm. And so, it's just good now that you know, he's finally spoken out because he has a powerful voice, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot sure of people, does. you know, look to him, and he hasn't always necessarily done the public statements, but, you know, he realized he can't go any longer without speaking up. And so just, like, you know, accept it, celebrate the fact that he did it, you know what I'm saying? You don't got to be like, this is not the time to really complain uh, about little, you know, uh, little things like that. Take what you can get. Yeah, take so what you can get. Not just take what uh -huh. you can get, but... Just rally together, yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, it's yeah, not about, yeah. you don't have to put him down just mm -hmm. because you don't think he, he did it in the time that mm -hmm. you wanted him to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. What so, about you, Randall? What what, what, uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, so so I would definitely agree with Paul, and I appreciate you dropping those, those mm -hmm. statistics and facts. Man. Yeah. So some of that I didn't even, even know about. But, you know, at the same time, I, I, I'm not sure that it's just that people are disappointed that it took this long for him to speak. It's good to know that he's, he's doing those type of things um, within his, his business to employ you know, more people of color and, and so forth. But I think what people, because he, he is such a, a powerful, uh, his brand and, and who he is and what he meant to uh, the NBA and to, to the black community, mm -hmm. what we wanted to see was more action attached to it as well. Mm -hmm. you know, now, I, I, can't, I can't criticize or speak to what he did, what mm -hmm. he didn't do what communities he, uh, you know, whether it was mentoring or giving back mm -hmm. to financially, whatever it may be. But at the same time, I think it kind of comes with the territory, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. the most powerful. All right, powerful. Randall was in the middle of his rant. <laughs> we back at it. Where to go, Vaughn? Where were you uh, at? Um, well, uh, he's more prom Michael Jordan, right. more prominent in society, so yeah. it might be more... Um, um, expected of him, etc. Right, right. And you know, I, I think I think it's that piece that you know we were hoping for more out of, right? Mm -hmm. and, and now knowing that he's stepping up in this moment, I think this is a critical moment, mm -hmm. you know, for not just Michael Jordan but all uh, prominent athletes mm -hmm. out there, particularly those uh, of color, mm -hmm. to stand up. You know, and definitely appreciate we should focus on that piece, mm -hmm. um, and and Mike should focus on how to keep that consistent. Right. I mean, they really make some some headway out of it. Last thing I'll say about that is, I do to a certain extent think it is his responsibility to understand the negative impacts that his brand might be having on the mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. right, that's also something that needs to be interrupted. Mm -hmm. Right, and he kind of holds the, the reins in, in terms of um, kind of acknowledging mm -hmm. that piece as well, um, and doing and taking steps to uh, not just focus on the bottom line. How we perceive ourselves, how we are perceived, what we value, what we attach value to, you know, and so forth. So. Yeah. So I know, and I saw this on, in, in, you know, inside that Facebook group. But I know that there are some, and I've spoken to some people who are close to me who are, who don't feel that there is any type of obligation from superstars, so to speak, to speak out on behalf of the community that they came from. Um, and I guess t in, in a very technical sense, I, I understand that, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, they're about getting their money, he's doing stuff without speaking up, so cool. But at the same time, hmm, how do, yo, know, it's, 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 it's such a complex issue, right? Because that's one of the things that I was gonna talk about is that I think one of the challenges that we have is that He's benefiting from the black community. 
the black community is the community that has kind of allowed his brand to become what it is, right? Um, because the hip hop culture, we're the ones that kind of like, we're like, yo, Jordans are the way to go. Jordans are the sneaker, that's what you want. Before other cultures started really rocking Jordans like that. Now Jordans aren't even your, your like Jordans where I first came out for you to play basketball in them. Now you don't wear Jordans to play basketball. <laughs> Jordans are a, are a fashion statement sneaker, yeah. right? So I would wear Jordans with the outfit that I have on not right now. Y'all would wear Jordans with the outfit that y'all have on right now. Why? Because it's almost like a dress sneaker. You see what I'm saying? Um, which which separates it from LeBron. Like when you look at LeBron's, LeBron's for the most part still look like they're only made for like the basketball scene. You know what I mean? So, but and then the price that's being charged for Jordans, right? And then we're seeing people who have in our communities who have killed each other just to have some Jordans, rob each other just to have some Jordans. And so I think like what you were saying, we still have to be careful not to say, yo, I, it's this person's sole responsibility to speak up. Why? Because at the end of the day, even him by himself can't do it all alone, right? We still need to come together as a community, you know what I'm saying, working together. But I do think that there is the challenge that, yo, when you look at other cultures, the people from other cultures readily speak up on behalf of their communities. You know what I'm saying? I think it's sometimes, it's, it's weird that it's only the black culture that it seems that we have to wait and wait and wait to hear from the people who we have kind of put up on a pedestal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I think that's interesting. Um, but I also, and I, I'm glad that this came back to mind, I also wanted to say this. I have to also realize, me not being the famous person, that there might be different things to consider when you're at that level, right? So. Some of the things that you might have to consider when you're at that level is if I am in a position to where I'm able to employ other black people right now, other people of color and give other people opportunity, if I begin to speak up and maybe I lose some endorsements or what have you that I have, that, or, or, or maybe I lose some of the funding that I have, depending on what arena that you're in, that allow me to be in position to put other people in position, right? So, I, and I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but I'm like, yo, know, maybe those are things that I don't have to consider right now that when, if I were to be at that level, I have to now begin uh, considering, right? Maybe I lose that ability to have influence through some of the work that I do if I begin to vocalize it, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I'm sure that there are other things, um, uh, for some truthfully, maybe they haven't managed their finances in such a way that will allow them to speak out without having to worry about taking a financial hit, unfortunately, right? And they still got to consider their family. But it goes back to what we were speaking about. I think we spoke about it last week, right, me and you, um, about the collective. Like, the, 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 we have to get to a point where we, we operate as a, as a unit so that no one person should have to feel that they have to bear everything on themselves altogether. When I look at Jewish cultures, I don't really see that one person in general has to bear the whole brunt of what's happening to the Jews, right? Because they've set themselves up so strongly as a community that the whole community can bear the weight. You know what I mean? And I think that's what, and that's part of what we're just trying to do here as we're starting these conversations, is trying to just force to that community involvement so that the community can bear the weight so that Jordan doesn't have to feel like it's only his voice that's gonna stand out. But if the community comes together, then forget everybody else's voice. We got a community that can sustain itself. Yeah. I mean, not everybody, in terms of athletes, going back to the athletes, mm -hmm. not everybody is gonna be Muhammad Ali. Right, you know right. Saying? Like Muhammad right. Ali, he was willing to speak out no matter what, mm -hmm. just because he knew it was right. And that was, his, that was actually his characteristic before a social issue even came up for him to have to do that. Right. And that was, you know, that was who he was, you know. People like him, you know, Jim Brown, you know, mm -hmm. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, mm -hmm. those kind of guys, they were just activists. That mm -hmm. was their nature, you know what I'm saying? But my issue is that, yeah, athletes, even though they're not necessarily, they didn't necessarily choose to be people of influence necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, they just, mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. a skill, mm -hmm. and because of that skill, mm -hmm. they've been thrust into the limelight. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are still young, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we can't act true. like they're 40, 50 that's year old true. grown men. 
you That's know, true. like Michael is now. But That's true. the reality is that I don't think we can expect everybody to um, to speak up in the same way. I think that's my issue. True. We, we want True. people to speak up and to do certain things the way that we expect them to or the way that we would do if we were in that situation. You don't know what you would do if you're in that situation because you're not in that situation. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You don't have as much to lose necessarily, like right. you said, in terms of endorsements, right. in terms of, you know, just sponsorship, right. sponsorship deals and those kind of things. Right. So you don't necessarily know what they're dealing with, but at the same time, I just, I don't like, you know, putting people in a box and expecting everybody to react or to, mm -hmm. you know, engage in the same way. That's my, that's, that's my thing. Everybody mm -hmm. has their role. Everybody has their own lane. And so, you know, whatever lane that you're comfortable in and whatever lane that you think you can have the most impact, then that's what you should do. You know what I'm saying? You, you shouldn't do something just because everybody's pressuring you to do that certain thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't think that's... You have another point on, on it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, I, I think that's that's a great point, man. That you know, I mean, that even that's biblical, right? That, mm -hmm. that we're all part of this one body, and, and each um, mm -hmm. member has mm -hmm. has a specific that's what I was function, yeah. right? Right, yeah. specific function yeah. and yeah. equal purpose, Absolutely. value, right? So, um, so I would definitely agree that um, with what you said. That being said, the one thing that we know people with power have is access. Right. right, so the same way we have financial advisors, right, all those guys have the best trainers, right, it, it, it's, it's about taking the initiative to seek out and, and, and gain access to those who can mentor you in effective and impactful, uh, you know, in, engagement of the community, right, or advocacy, right, so I, I, think, I think it still does fall on their, their shoulders to the extent that if you want to make an impact, there's ways to prep yourself Put yourself be able mm -hmm. to do so in a way yeah. that's authentic to you mm -hmm. and that means something to the community. Yeah, I and and I, I would also say, and this is kind of going back to the earlier point, that I think it's, it's also important that we don't get caught up in this kind of status quo thing either, right? Like it's not it's not just that we are employing this many people of color, right? Mm -hmm. Who are you employing, and what type of position are we putting them mm -hmm. in in order to? kind of again pay it forward, right? So so I, I feel like it's great that he's employing them. Are they coming from communities or circumstances where people and recruiters might not readily look? Mm -hmm. You know, what schools are they coming from? What degree, you know, what trade like yeah. and what position are they getting into? Right. Are, are, are they are and are they climbing? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're setting them up to eventually go on mm -hmm. and create their own brand. Mm -hmm. Right? So I, I think I think that's a great first step to give them access, but again, like like you all were alluding to, if we're not equipping them to then do their own thing, mm -hmm, right. you know, we're just falling right into that same cycle. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's basically what I was gonna say. I was really gonna touch on that, you know, uh, playing to our strengths. So sometimes uh, we want people to do things in our way, but really we need the whole community, which means that we need people in different areas. We need Paul to be uh, a musician, you know, and use his music talent to impact, to have an impact. We need Randall operating within the higher ed system, um, within colleges and universities, to, to be able to help students out who um, might need somebody to look to, who understand some of the cultural nuances or what have you, you know what I'm saying? You might need me, I don't even know what to call myself, guys. I got a bunch of stuff going. But you need the person who just does a bunch of different stuff which or, or, or set something like this up to get it out to the world that there are people out there doing stuff like this, you know what I'm saying? So, um, or just even just to use his voice, you know, like what I do most of the time in order to just empower and, 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 and impact, man. So we need it all. We need it all. So, uh, Jordan, we thank you. You probably never see this, but we thank you for <laughs> even the small contribution that you gave, man. And uh, if you feel like sending anybody else a million dollars, we will gladly Lord, accept it from you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, gladly accept it from you. Um, uh, uh, what, 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 what's, y'all had anything else that y'all wanted to discuss? I know we spoke about uh, a couple of other things, too. Yeah, but this is related. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of, it's kind of going back to our initial point, talking about the diversity, you know. All right, we back to camera show. <laughs> we go work it. Y'all, we're using what we have in order to oh, do what we can, all right? Until we get another DSLR 
like the Panasonic, which runs continuously, or some other video camera. Just bear with us in these breaks, all right? But, Paul, you were about to jump into another topic. Yeah, I'm going to fire you. But, um, <laughs> from my own show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, education is, is really a critical part of what we need in terms of moving forward, mm -hmm. um, in terms of just the, the race relations in this country. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that was one of the things for me. That's why I, I spoke about diversity, um, you know, being at a school like Andrews and being able to interact, learning how to interact with people who are not like you, mm -hmm. you know, people who come from different backgrounds, people who think differently, being able to engage with them in, in ways that are uh, mutually beneficial. You know what I'm saying? And at the core of the issues that we're having today, I think that's it. You know, we don't understand how to relate to other people. And that kind of touches on, you know, the video that you uh, um, sent to us uh, from Jane Elliott. And that's one of the things that she talks about. But, you know, it's about education. It's about learning how to interact with people. And that's why educators are so important. You know, that's why what Randall's doing here is so important. You know, because when you learn how to interact with people and when you learn that, you know, even though you're from a different place from me, mm -hmm. you know, we're still brothers, we're still sisters, we're still part of the human race, as she said. You know, we're not yeah. different just because of yeah. the color of our skin or the yeah. color of our eyes or where we came from. You know, that's when really uh, we'll start to build bridges and start mm -hmm. to really make the connections that are needed to really be able to interact in a civilized manner. You know what I'm saying? And really be able to love one another and to be able to, you know, be peaceful, you know, and you know, interact with others. So, absolutely. And, and, and I would just I would add on to that as well. Um, this is in slightly a different direction, but I, I think education is key, and, and the access that education gives to different experiences, people, and perspectives, mm -hmm. I think is key. But I, I also think that we're we're, we're kind of up against. We're, we're up against people having uh, misperceptions of, about what came to be, right? So I think some ways mm -hmm. you got to re-educate, right? Exactly. Right. So um, you know, if, if my perception of who built the White House is different from the other person, mm -hmm. then we're never gonna, you know, come to any mm -hmm. understanding about mm -hmm. who's most important or who it, that that we are equally mm -hmm. important to this country, right? So I, I think I think we really have to strive to. Systematically, like expose people to a broad range of education, mm -hmm. um, so that we're on the same page about this is how you contributed, and it, even though you know it may seem like it was in spite of you, mm -hmm. here's where you fit into that that equation and the creation of this in another way, right? That's as beneficial, mutually beneficial. I just I feel like that piece is is left off because it's a sensitive topic. Right, um, and we're more in competition with who, whose country this is, mm -hmm. than, than mm -hmm. trying to create some sort of cohesion around mm -hmm. that that concept. So, um, I, I I would agree, and I think higher ed or education in general mm -hmm. is a great platform for exploring those types of thought processes. Yeah, I had I had um, the best of both of, both worlds to an extent because I went to Stony Brook University. Um, well, I went to Uniondale High School, right, um, and grew up in the Uniondale. Shout out to Uniondale. Shout out to all of Long Island. But um, I grew up in the Uniondale School District where, you know, it was really, at the time that I was going there, it was a predominantly black school district um, as far as the students that went there. But it wasn't really, I mean, we pretty much were learning what any other students would learn, though, you know what I'm saying? Um, when I went to Stony Brook University, I was finally in a diverse situation where yo you had everything there you know say anything that you could ask for was there okay um and so i learned how to operate and interact on a day-to-day -day basis like you were talking about with other cultures but then for grad school i went to oakwood university down in huntsville alabama which is an hbcu and that was also beneficial because i got the chance now to hear about things from a perspective that was specific to me, like we discussed issues from black perspectives, um, 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 you know, black heritage and understanding some of the, the different things that we've been through and understanding some of the things that are going on today, the ramifications, potential solutions to situations. So I think that I've been able to get a well-rounded perspective. So all of those situations are valuable and now I think that positions me to help 
bring all of those together so that we can all have a, a, a well-rounded view. You know, but uh, again, I think the education piece, however, is crucial, man. And not just education, we're not just talking about academic education, but just the social education. Oh, Jane used the term, Jane, oh my gosh. Yo, she used the term emotional education at that, man. And I thought that was a beautiful term because um, so many times we only look at at education from just a merely academic or let me just learn the words, let me just learn to regurgitate information. And we don't, you know, when educators educate, you know what I'm saying, and what we're doing here is a type of education, um, but it, whether you're learning or whether you're the person who's educating, a part of learning and a part of education and a part of interaction is understanding that people learn and a part of their learning is an emotional experience. You know what I'm saying? And a part of your learning is your psychological disposition. And so if we don't, we, so, like education for so many years has only addressed the, 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 the merely informative aspect of human beings and it has not addressed human beings, the emotions that human beings go through. You know what I'm saying? What, what impact does what they're learning have on how they feel? Or how does what they're experiencing outside of the classroom impact their ability to receive the information that's being given to them. It, you know, and we don't even have to limit that to just um, academic institutions. Let's go to, we're all here, for the three of us are Christians, right? But whether we're talking about Christians, Christians, whether you're talking about folks who might be from other religions or might be from things that they don't consider religions, but, but they consider maybe a, a spiritual kind of thing or what have you, right? But, but one of the things that I notice is that sometimes in church, Sometimes information will just be given out or what have you, but sometimes you fail to address the, the emotive part of a human being in, in, and, and how that affects their ability to receive or give information. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just, just to hit on that topic of emotion, I mean, if one of the, the, the most prevalent emotions that we've seen in, in society today is fear. Mm -hmm. Fear can make you do mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Fear can make you <coughs> do, do a heck of Absolute. a lot of things. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And um, a lot of times that emotion could uh, just take over everything else, mm -hmm. you know, and, and push out rationale, push mm -hmm. out logic, push out uh, empathy, all those things because this emotion is clouding mm -hmm. every part of your being, you're permeating every part of your mm -hmm. being. So um, I, I think I think you're exactly right, man. Being being able to provide spaces, mm -hmm. right, brave spaces for those emotions to be discussed, um, and, and most importantly, shared. I think. Yeah, no, I was just thinking, um, you know, if there's one thing that any, any young people watching this can take is you got to learn to think for yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to learn to think critically. Um, you talk about the fear that's going on right now. You know, a lot of fear comes from just misinformation mm -hmm. or just a lack of information. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't just take... You know, I mean, the sad reality is that, you know, our education system is, is not really entirely comprehensive in all of the things that they teach, especially in terms of history and those kind of things. So you got to be willing to take what they give you, but you have to be willing to go beyond and to really ask questions and to really search for information for yourself so that you can make fully informed decisions. You know what I mean? Um, there's been a lot of, you know, issues in terms of the democratic convention that's going on, mm -hmm. you know, the chairperson had to kind of step down mm -hmm. because of leaked information and those kind of things and super delegates and all those issues. But the reality is that, you know, we have the illusion of democracy in our country. Our country is not a democracy, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And so people get all upset when, you know, they feel like their voice is not fully being heard, but the system is not completely designed for you to really have... Um, you have a voice, but it's, it's not just based solely on your voice, you know what I'm saying? We are a republic, we're not a, dem a democracy. And so there are just other systems in place than just, you know, the popular vote right, to really right, um, right. create um, or to determine, you know, who comes into office. And so just understanding those kind of things, and then we, we learned that in American history. I mean, I, I learned that in 10th, 11th grade or whatever, or whatever but... You don't necessarily think about it all the time, and so sometimes you forget, but you have to just really, you know, look and, and figure out for yourself really what's happening and, and 
uh, so that you don't have to succumb to, like you said, the emotion of fear. You don't have to let the fear override um, the intellectual uh, understanding that you have of situations. So. Yeah, and I think that fear, you know, um, again, and I, I, I forgot if, if it was somebody who was mentioning it or what have you, but, you know, to be reminded that God has not given us a spirit of fear, you know what I'm saying? That, not to sound preacher or anything like that, but, like, when you begin operating out of fear, I, I, like, you become, what, what is it called? Um, you know, you become paralyzed. You know what I'm saying? Now you don't, you won't do anything, and um, that that's exactly what we're trying to fight against. Is this is this spirit of fear that causes you to freeze, and then you end up not getting anything done? You know, and and I think part of that is understanding that. Listen, um, at the end of the day, you never know what life is gonna throw at you. You know what I'm saying? So you don't even have time to be operating out of fear. Um, and 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 I love it because Gary Vaynerchuk. And you had wanted to talk about this a little bit too, yeah. like, and this is coming at the spirit of fear from another angle. But one of the things that Gary Vaynerchuk, um, you know, has been talking about a lot lately is that a lot of us never go out and do anything. Like some of y'all have some great ideas in your head right now for, as far as developing a business. Some of y'all, it's not even about developing a business. Some of y'all have a dope idea just to write a nice song or to develop some nice, some nice art or to do something nice for somebody or to develop something, right? Just, just to do something. But we get so caught up in what our husband is thinking about us, what our wife is thinking about us. We get so caught up in what our parents are thinking about us, what our brother and sister, our friends. <laughs> the camera tried to cut me off too now, y'all. It's <laughs> cutting everybody off today, right? But, but we get, to go back to what I was saying, we get so caught up in what everybody else is thinking about us. And yo, if there's anybody that has suffered from this, it has been me in many ways, y'all. There are certain things that, yo, I'm wondering like, yo, is, does this, is, is the product perfect? as yet for me to put out, you know what I'm saying? Is the video perfect as yet before I put the video out, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, um, like I'm, I'm always in this constant, have this constant battle going on of like, yo, I want everything to be absolutely perfect before I step out at, on faith and actually interact, you know what I'm saying, and actually engage and do it. And what, but it's amazing because, yo, when you look at the car companies, the car companies, they put the model out then the model still has to be fixed. Apple puts an app out or Apple puts a product out, but you still get updates for the Apple iPhone, you know what I'm saying? The product is not perfect before they put the product out. You, the, a, a house might be built, but the house still requires some maintenance. Or they even say, yo, listen, when you, put, when you build a new house, right, you let it settle for one year. Why? Because after it settles, then you'll see kind of um, where some deformities are, some things that might need to uh, come in and still be addressed. So when you look at those things that people build, when you look at people who have success, in almost any arena, the product is never perfect at first. Yo, artists start, most of the artists, well, back in, y'all young folks may not really know about this like that, right? But we know what mixtapes are, right? And mixtapes now, like, when you see Drake putting out a mixtape and all that kind of stuff, it ain't the same type of mixtape as back in the day, because the mixtapes now be sounding real good. You know what I'm saying? But back in the day, we know, <laughs> right, we grew up around the time when, yo, somebody, they would just find a beat and try to mix and cut the beat um, from a song that they like, but then rap on top of it, and then it's just on a little um, cassette tape, and they just trying to take the cassette tape and put it in front of anybody who will try to listen. Why? Because they know that if they do that, somebody will hear something and then be like, yo, all right, cool. Let's let's see what you would sound like if we put you on an official track and master the sound and all that kind of stuff, right? So, but, but if you wait for that perfect product, if you wait to know everything, now I'm not saying to just jump in there or willy-nilly, but stop waiting, right? Stop waiting to have influence. Stop waiting to have to develop the product. Like our community, the black, because this show, why we... So a white person might watch this and we hope that it's beneficial for them because we, we have no problem with white folks at all. We have no problem with Asian folks. We have no problem with, uh, with where, wherever you're from, right? But specifically, this show is developed for the black community because the black community has some specific challenges right now that we need to overcome. And listen, we don't have a lifetime to wait for you to start working on your idea. Start working on the idea. Start putting the product out. Start collaborating with other people who might have other pieces that can be additions or, or can help elevate your, the idea that you have, right? You may not have all the pieces. Somebody else that you have has all the pieces. 
I don't have the, the specific access to universities, but, but who has access? You have access. Natalie, one of our, our homegirls, um, has access, right? Other people who have brought me in to speak, why? Because they have the access to the universities. I have the voice, so they use my voice or what have you, and I use the fact that they have access to the, to the university, right? And then we pull, well, I don't know what Paul does, but we have Paul here just to be a pretty face, right? <laughs> nah, but, but, but what, what did Paul do? Paul, when I was out there living in Michigan, what did Paul do? Paul brought me in to, to, to use the music talent that I have, right? And use that as an opportunity for me to have influence and have significance. The other day, I, have, I still have the music talent. Paul happens to be living out here now, so Paul has a voice. Paul reads some books. Paul just gave me a bunch of books that I have been waiting to read, and he actually happened to have them, and I have some books that he wants to read. So we're, we're reading up on each other's books now, right? And so Paul has something to contribute here, and he brought me in to play drums um, um, at the church that he plays for a little while ago, right? So they'll, so I'm t telling you, like networking, we didn't even talk about this today, but networking, I'm realizing is so important if we're gonna have success, right? As our battery is getting ready to shut off, right? <laughs> we're, we're seeing a red light blinking. But, but network, figure out who you need to connect to, who has some of the ideas and some of the skills, I think I talked about this in other videos too, that you need to connect with so that we can all elevate together. So. Um, yeah, by all means, I hope that this video has been beneficial uh, to, to all of you, man. Average is failure, as I always say. Uh, you know, success is intentional. Character is legendary. The, uh, Young Black America, this is episode three. So this is three episodes in. This is the first episode that we've been able to do together. Um, I have some ideas for some other people that we might get on some of the episodes, too. Uh, one person in particular that I have in mind. I'm going to reach out to her today and hopefully we can begin picking her brain also, man. So, yeah, we hope this is... Oh, oh, listen. Subscribe to the channel, all right? Subscribe to the channel because we want y'all to stay on top of, of this, man. And by all means, this is something that we're doing for free. So, it's not like we're getting financial gain out of this. We just want this information to hit as many people as possible. So, please like the videos and share the video also with people that you feel that this would be beneficial also. And more important than even any of that stuff, Please, if you have questions that you want us to talk about on this show, if you have ideas, like write it in the comment section, whether it be on, reach out to us on Facebook, reach out to us on Instagram, uh, reach out to us wherever, um, so that we can just engage with you, dialogue with you, and then um, answer some of your questions. Let us know if you disagree with some of the stuff. We don't mind sharing some of, like if you disagree, we'll feel more than comfortable enough sharing some of your thoughts or what have you and perspectives on the show also, right? This is for all of us to grow. Oh well, Paul, Paul said, nah, we're not sharing anybody's perspective. But don't listen to him, right? <laughs> Luckily, I get to say who, what perspective we share or not. But yeah, man, let us know. We don't want to just be talking. We want to engage with you in dialogue because it's through the engaging dialogue that we're all going to grow together. So um, from Randall, from Paul, from Coach Vaughn, we say peace out to you. Peace, love, and blessings to you all. Holla. You're not going to peace the people out, Paul? I gave them a lot. Just joking. Peace out, y'all. Holla.